Good morning from my side too, and uh, especially to those of you that are visiting with us for our Easter Sunday service. Um, I do want to quickly uh, just acknowledge people that might be here under duress. Uh, maybe you were tricked in some way, or you were pressured or manipulated or promised a really good meal afterwards. Uh, however you landed up here, I, I cannot stress this enough. We consider it an honor and a privilege that you would even consider trusting us with a bit of your time. I'm under no illusion that it would be uncomfortable for some people to come into this kind of an environment and, and to not be sure of what you think or what you believe. Uh, maybe, you're, maybe you are exploring Christianity. Uh, maybe you're not convinced of anything at all. And, and so there, there'd be a range of emotions, thoughts, and uh, comfort levels in this room. And so I just want to acknowledge that and ask you just to give us a few more minutes as I do my best to explain to you in a very short space of time what I believe Easter is all about. Uh, another way of putting that is to say what the gospel is all about. Maybe you've heard that word or salvation. We've heard that term in, in different contexts and I'll unpack it a little bit in a moment. But, but, but especially, I mean, all of it comes down to wanting to help us understand uh, what is the greatest invitation purchased at the highest possible price that is um, offered to us, we get to respond, that actually fills up the emptiness that is inside of us, but how it's also a journey. So I'm asking you just to lean in to, to first consider what is being said before making any kind of quick judgment. But also, the, the last comment I want to make is for people that have maybe been on the road for a long time. Maybe you've been a Christian or you've, or you've kind of been familiar to church for, for many, many years. I want to encourage you to try and listen with fresh ears because I am personally convinced that this is not a one and done scenario. This is not a a moment, this is not just a once in your lifetime or a once in a moment type of thing. This is actually an ongoing invitation, an ongoing relationship, uh, an ongoing uh, drawing and, and kindly inviting us to a life that actually becomes increasingly filled with healing, with wholeness, with freedom, with purpose, with peace. And love. And so when we talk about the beautiful empty, we yes, we are referring to the tomb, which we celebrate being empty on Easter Sunday. Uh, but we need to acknowledge that for many of us, there's an ugly empty too. Uh, whether or not it's this whole massive chasm or whether it is uh, little parts of our lives. And the way we know that is when we, I think a lot of the time, we, it's the difference between desire and delight. It's, it's when we try and feed desires, so we try and feed our, our appetites. So, so there, there's this craving, and we all have appetites. It may look different for different people, but we all have certain appetites that we try and medicate or stimulate. And it does work for a while. If, if, if it didn't, we wouldn't turn to it. But if we're honest with ourselves, and if we slow down enough and reflect enough, we find that a lot of the time, in fact, most of the time, if not all of the time, it actually leaves us wanting more in the sense of, we're not satisfied, and so, we, and so we actually have an even greater hunger. Like, like it's, it's actually leaving us a little bit frustrated, a little, a little dis dissatisfied, not in a healthy way. That's, that's when we're just, just trying to feed our appetites, just trying to feed our desires to fill what could be a numb empty, um, a desperate empty, an ugly empty. But then there's something that I want to refer to as delight, which is when we're actually allowing God to lead us into a way of life. It's not just a decision. It's actually a following in a way of life that actually increasingly brings delight, which actually leaves us satisfied. It actually leaves us content. It actually leaves us increasingly filled. And that, I believe, is the difference between what us as Christians call the gospel and what really the rest of the world would maybe call religion or a philosophy of life. And, and it's completely understandable. It's just that to oversimplify it, all other religions and all other philosophies is what we have to do to come to this place of full realization or, or full satisfaction, or a lot of religions are about how we need to build our way up to being acceptable and good enough to God so that He will accept us. And that is the complete opposite to Christianity, which is why it's so often scandalous and why it's so often actually a little bit offensive, because we want to be able to pay. We want to be able to contribute. We want to be able to earn but what is so radical and what is in some cases scandalous when we really understand the message of Easter, when we really understand what Jesus has done for us, is that it's actually quite scandalous and, and in some cases uncomfortable for us to consider that something so big, which means, so by that I'm referring to the death of Jesus on the cross, paying for our sins so that we can't, we have nothing further to add. We have no, there's nothing more that we can do to, to contribute to that 
forgiveness that was purchased on the cross, for us to actually accept that. It's, a, it's, it's quite a radical idea when you think about it. And so what I want to do is just use four little phrases that actually helped me when I was first involved with children. I can't believe how complicated we can make it as adults. Yeah. I realized this when I went on my first missions trip, and I'm like, how am I going to explain this to villagers? Because, because I, had, I had increasingly made this complex in my mind and over-philosophizing different parts. And then, I, and then I kind of like had this memory of how simple it was when we were trying to explain this to children. And it actually makes so much more sense. And I... A lot of us could spend more time in kids' church. Yeah. Just a side note. Like, they, they, there's a lot of helpful... In other words, they teach a lot clearer than what I do a lot of the time. Okay? It's a little bit simpler, and it's just to the point. I know. I know. I know. So, it's under these four headings. G God loves me. I have sinned. Jesus died for me. I have to choose to follow him. Now, if you'll bear with me, allow me just to unpack each one very quickly. The first being that God loves me. Way too often... Way too many people, Christians included, start with, you've sinned, which, which the, implication, the implication of which is that you're bad, you're ugly, you're dissatisfying, God's probably pretty miffed at you, and, and I can understand that, but that's not actually where the story begins. The story begins with God's love for us. He created us. It was intentional. It was in order to have relationship. It starts with love. I would argue that God loves you more than you would ever to dare hope. It's so hard for us to imagine Him loving us that much and not feeling like, like that would be unhealthy, like we could take advantage of that. I would argue that when we realize how much He loves us, we don't want to take advantage of anything. At least we don't want to take it for granted. We don't want to abuse it. Our hearts are actually melted, and we, we actually want to trust more, and we want to surrender more. When we, if, you, if we only knew how good God is, if we only knew how much God loves us, I think it'd be so much easier for us to actually choose the path that leads to life in the sense of, okay, God, I want to delight in you versus just trying to satisfy every craving, every desire that I have. It starts with God loves me. Even the very first account of humans recorded in the Bible, they were the first humans made, Adam and Eve, when they chose to reject God's one and only condition. And in case you have any judgment towards Adam and Eve, if it wasn't them, it'd be me. It'd be you, right? It's like, don't touch the wet paint. Like, like we just, we just, like, what are you keeping from me, right? There's just something in us. When they did this, again, it can so easily be communicated as though they had to grovel and make their way back to God and that the story is about people making their way back. The Bible's not about people making their way back to God. The, the whole meta-narrative of the Bible is about God trying to reach out to people. And so even at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve rejected God's beautiful plan, they didn't go looking for him. He went looking for them. He went looking, well, when I say looking, I mean I use that term in inverted commas because he knew where they were. Maybe you've realized that when God's looking for you, it's not because he doesn't know where you are. When he calls out to them, it's not because he doesn't know where they are. It, it wasn't for his benefit. It was for their benefit. Yeah. And I genuinely do believe that ever since then, God has been, because of his love, he is motivated by love, nothing else. Because of his love for us, he's been calling out to people ever since, and it's more for our benefit than for him. For years. When he says to Adam and Eve, where are you? I think that's a really, really helpful question for us to even reflect on. Where am I actually? Obviously, I'm not talking literally. If you don't know where you are, you've got way bigger problems. Okay? But where are you in your life? Where are you in relation to God's love and God's invitation? And, and I don't mean this facetiously when I, when I ask you, if it's, if it's not trying to follow him and, and respond to him, my question, and you might not be able to answer this right now, you may only be able to answer this in 10 or 20 or 30 years, but I'm hoping that at some point it'll come back to you, is how's it working out for you? And I, I promise you I don't mean that with, with, with any bite. I mean, somewhere along the line, when we're trying to do our own thing, I think to have integrity, from time to time, we need to step back and say, is that actually working out? Like, am I actually becoming a person of increasing peace, of increasing love, of 
increasing joy? Am I, am I more generous? Am, am I able to hold on to things more loosely? Am I harder to offend? Am I, am I a, just a more kind person? Am I, am I maturing? Am I becoming a better, more whole version of myself? Forget about anyone else, just looking at you. Somewhere along the line, we need to ask ourselves and reflect honestly on whether or not the path you've chosen is working out for you. And by the way, I would include anybody that considers themselves a Christian. Now, in case that scares you, the reason I'm saying that is because I can have made a decision to follow Jesus. I can have made a decision to accept his forgiveness, but then for all intents and purposes, for the most part, just live my own life. And so again, it's just a respectful question to ask, how's it working out for you? Like, do you, do you feel like you are growing and maturing. God loves us. Now, as much as I say that, I want to be so clear that this is not a knowledge issue in the traditional sense of the word as what it is an experience issue. One of the early church leaders is recorded in scripture writing to some Christians in a place called Ephesus, where in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19, he's recorded saying, may you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully. So even Paul's saying, you can't understand it fully, but, but he's praying that they will experience it. Then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. In other words, the more I experience God's love, the more complete, the more full I will be. The, the, the more that beautiful empty will become beautiful fullness as I experience his love. Now, for those of you that have heard me share this before, please just give me some grace. The best example that I can think of in my own life is when it comes to our oldest daughter who we adopted as a teenager. And because of her not having come from a background where she was with us from birth and where we were able to prove our love and trustworthiness from the very beginning, it made me realize how little words mean and how little knowledge is. Love has to be experienced. For trust to be earned. Now, now in our case, th this is me saying this. This was never from her. She never ever expressed this whatsoever. I had to realize that we have a lot of trust earning to do. It's no good us just telling her, Mish, we love you. Mish, we care. Mish, we, like, we've changed our lives for you. We, we love you. We want you. We care about you. I think, that those, I think that that was helpful, like it's positive, but it was only as she failed and saw how we responded it was only when there was distance and they saw how we would perhaps try and lean in and press into her in a, in a healthy sense. Um, it, was, it was how we worked through conflict. It was, how, it was how we responded on the few occasions that she would ask for anything which she really struggled to do because she wasn't secure enough in our love. And so this might sound strange to you, especially if you're parents of, of kids that have been with you from birth, you might not relate to this at all. You might be like, I wish they would ask less. When, you, when you're wanting someone to trust you and love you, you want them to ask you. I wanted her to ask. It was the greatest compliment. It was the greatest uh, sense of, okay, she's becoming more secure in our, in our love. She's trusting us more when she would dare to ask us for something. Now, the point that I'm making here is that she's been on a journey we're all on different journeys. And so I want to encourage you, if you feel a little bit more like Micheline when it comes to God, and you're like, well, I've heard this all my life, or I've heard little bits and pieces, or I've been told this, or maybe you've even grown up in church, and so, and so knowledge is not the problem, but you haven't experienced the love of God, I just want to encourage you to be kind to yourself, to give God the benefit of the doubt that maybe he's a bit kinder to you than what you think, and all I can ask you to do and encourage you to do is to take little steps of asking and giving him the opportunity to actually respond. That doesn't mean he's going to give you everything you want when you want it. There are a couple of different answers to prayer. Yes. Not now. No. I've got something better. And I'm going to be honest with you and prepare you for any kind of disappointment in the future. There's a fourth type, which is just silence. Sometimes there are things that we go through in our lives that we just can't explain, and God, and God doesn't promise to explain it to us. He promises to go through it with us, and he just says, Trust me, 
but he knows what we can handle. So my encouragement is that as we remember that God loves us, that we would actually dare to trust him. Now, God, God cannot love us more. I just want you to think about that for a moment. God cannot love you more. Nothing you can do can make God love you more. Nothing you do can make God love you less. If that's a simple concept for you to get your head around, you're not thinking about it long enough, because that's hectic. I do want to clarify that we can please Him more and we can please Him less, but there's nothing that you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. God is constant. We're the only variables, and this is where the problem comes in, because even though God loves us, number one, number two, we have sin. Now, I know that that would be a very contentious even term in the 21st century, so Allow me to even just philosophize a little bit. It's, it's where we have chosen to not walk his path. There's a path that I am convinced leads to life. It's pretty narrow. It means that there are fewer options, but it leads to life. In case that offends you, I just want to, I just want to make you, uh, I want to help you consider for a moment. If you're married, maybe you're not married, but if ever you hope to be married, or maybe, you've, maybe you are in a relationship, you have a girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever the case is, it would matter to you that the relationship, the commitment to you is pretty narrow. If you want to experience intimacy, the single greatest key is exclusivity. That was for free, okay? You want intimacy in your marriage or, or, you, or you want to have a trustworthy relationship in a dating, court, courting relationship? By the way, when you're dating for 25 years, that's, I mean, engaged for 25 years, that's not dating or engaged, just so you know. That's common law marriage. It's like all nothing, but anyway. <laughs> Exclusivity leads to intimacy. You don't have to agree with any kind of biblical morality to agree that it just makes sense that there is a path that's going to lead to a healthier relationship, and there's a path when, when you can do whatever you want to with whomever you want to that's probably going to have a negative effect on your relationship. Would we agree? Yeah. So in the same way, Man, there are some obvious signs of sin, things like racism, sexism, exploitation, corruption, gender-based violence in South Africa, gun violence in the U.S. I know there is in South Africa as well. I just think, like, we don't even pay attention anymore. But, but in the U.S., since the year 2020, until last month, it was reported again on CNN, 29th of March, gun violence is the single greatest cause of death for children in America. That is because of sin. We can spin it however we like, but, but when the number one cause of death in, in a first world country amongst children is through gun violence, like, we, there's something in us that knows that there's something wrong with that picture. But then there are the more subtle issues, which are actually the issues beneath the issues, and that is when it comes to our attitudes, when it comes to greed, gossip, jealousy, bitterness, unforgiveness. These are the things that actually lead to increasing breakdown. It affects our relationships, affects our families, which in turn affects so many other things with us. When God calls us to, to a way of life, it's because it is a way that actually leads to life. And when we reject it, Adam and Eve, literally, they had one thing to not do. It's like you had one job, guys. One job. Don't eat from that tree. They already knew everything that was good, by the way. It's interesting that, the, that it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Like, they already knew good. They knew God. Isn't it amazing how we have this curiosity to the other side? Like, I'm just curious. I'm just interested. And that's, again, that's our human nature. That is understandable. But that leads to separation from God. We have sinned. And by the way, I think that the real issue, the, the sin beneath the sin, if you will, it wasn't about eating a piece of fruit, guys. Just so you know. It is about actually trusting God's way. Again, if you're a parent and you tell your child, uh, look, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff that we've got in the cupboard that, that we're keeping for Easter, and then you find out that, that you know, they've been kind of going in behind your back and and uh, stealing some of the eggs. I mean, for some of us, that might just be like, ah, 
cute, depending on the age I get. But somewhere along, okay, no, that's a bad example. Okay, let's put it this way. Let's say you've, no, no, because we're going to be like, ah, sugar, like we, okay, we all get it. Okay, let's say you find out that your child's been taking money from your wallet, okay? Is the real issue the money? Similarly, I think what we do when we try and make a religion of morality is we just think God is just disappointed in our, ugh, like, that's gross, that's dirty, that's naughty. That's not, that's not the heart. There's a, there's, a, there's a concern beneath the concern. The issue is beneath the issue. There's a sin beneath the sin, which is that, God, I don't trust you. I don't trust that your way will fulfill me. I don't trust that your way will satisfy me, and so I'm going to make my own way. That is the crux of sin. It's saying, I don't want the narrow path with fewer options where I'm actually trusting you and I'm going in a direction. I want the broader path. And, and the thing about God is you're allowed. Like we have a choice, but then we have to obviously take some of the consequences. So God loves us. We have sinned. Number three, Jesus died for me. This is a, this is a radical, and if it really sinks in, I believe life-changing thought. The fact that Jesus died for me. One of the most powerful passages of Scripture in this regard is found in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, which says that God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners. While we, in other words, before we cared, before we were repentant, before we asked, before we didn't ask Him to do, no, 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 He loves us. And, bec- and when, when, when we chose to abuse that love, he made a way for us to be restored to him. And even though it is completely free, you can't add anything to it, it came at the highest possible price. The suffering death, the suffering separation from God for, for a little bit on Easter Friday when he was on the cross because he was he was forsaken for a while because of taking on all the, the world's sin. So there was, a mo- there was a time that he was separated from the Father, first time in eternity. He suffered, he was separated, and he died. And the good news, of course, is that he rose again in order to pay the debt that we owed. Now, again, you might think, well, if God loves us, why, why does someone have to pay? Again, at the risk of being a little bit over, overly philosophical, Nothing is free. Nothing. You're sitting on a chair that someone paid for. You're sitting in a building that someone paid for. We're enjoying air that people have paid for. Perhaps one of the greatest examples for me recently is someone that I love, someone that's very close to me in my life, where has faced many, many battles, uh, personal challenges, etc., and and a lot of those choices landed him up in hospital for the better part of the last six months. Now, we're talking since the end of September until being discharged yesterday and busy recovering. I have no idea what the hospital bill would be, but it wouldn't surprise me if it's in the millions. But it's free. He hasn't paid a cent. But someone has. For us to realize and appreciate that even when we want stuff for free or we want to win something, yes, I'm, I'm receiving it for free, but it's costing someone. If you manage to somehow jimmy the bank and, you know, you, ugh, the bank's got enough money, I say, well, you may be getting it for free, but someone's paying. Nothing is free. Now, if you allow your mind to go, you might get frustrated and irritated that people receive things for free, and what if they take advantage of it and take it for granted? And that's why we're not God, because we couldn't handle the idea of us paying so much, of us paying such a high price and someone not appreciating it. And so that's why we naturally want to use guilt to motivate someone to then change their lives because there's been such a high price. But even then, that's not God's heart. It's not about guilt. It's about gratitude. For me to realize, okay, hold on, I have pretty much my entire life lived off of other people. You can try and manage that, that guilt and tension, and maybe people use it to manipulate you, or you can say, okay, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I have a lot to be grateful for. God, help me to respond with a simple step. 
with whatever I can. When we realize how outrageous the gift is, it shouldn't feed guilt in us. It should actually feed gratitude in us. Which then brings us to the fourth and final idea, which is that I have to choose to follow him. God loves me. I've sinned, which means that I've, pushed my, I've pursued my path, pushed him away. Jesus died for me to make a way for me to be reconciled. But then I'm left with a choice where I have to actually choose to follow him. Jesus said the following in Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. We actually have to give up our own way because there is a way of life. There are a lot of ways of life that leads to death, and then there's a way of life that actually leads to life. And it's a choice that we have. We cannot earn anything. We can't deserve anything. No, no, we can only respond. We can only respond to the kindness and the grace and the love of God. In fact, sometimes I try and make it as simple as two ideas. We have to accept forgiveness and we have to choose to follow. You can't do the one without the other. You can't follow him in the hope that that's gonna lead to salvation. No, no, we have to accept this free gift gracious gift of forgiveness, and we realize that only God can give me the power to actually follow him. But at the same time, we can't think, well, okay, thanks, Jesus, peace out, like, great, yay, and then I just keep living my own life. Well, then, then I've got to question whether or not I've actually accepted. I think that when I accept this gracious gift of forgiveness, it starts to do something in me. And the more I respond to it, the more it does something in me. But it is a journey. I'm going to warn you, just like I said with, with our daughter, it, it has been an ongoing journey. She's 28, it's still a journey. It's okay for it to be a journey, but I want to encourage you that we have a choice to make. I'll say what I said at the very beginning. Salvation is a once-off experience, but it's also an ongoing experience. The reason I say that is because even that term salvation is used in the Bible interchangeably. So in, in, in our English translations of the uh, Greek New Testament, we use different words for the same original word depending on the context. So the word salvation can mean, yes, you've been delivered. Spiritually, you are, you are set free. You're a new creation. You now actually have the power to please God. But it can also refer to healing. Salvation can also refer to being healed. You, your soul is being healed. Your identity is being restored, which, by the way, next week we're starting a series on identity because I don't think that we should focus on issues as much as identity. Our identity influences our issues. And when we realize who we are in God, whole another story. Let's come back next week. So, so salvation refers to healing, to deliverance, to being made whole. It refers to freedom. And just like this idea of, of the tombstone has been moved, we still have a choice whether or not we're actually going to walk through. We've been set free. I have a choice whether or not I'm going to walk in that freedom. God loves me. I have sinned. Jesus died for me. I have to choose to live for him. It is a choice. And I want to conclude by reminding us that if we recognize how good God is, how kind God is, the price that he's paid for us, I think that it will stir up, it'll stimulate a response in us. I want to conclude with showing you a quick little clip. If you've watched this movie before, then, then you will remember the team doesn't have to come up just yet, guys, you're fine. <laughs> so sorry, guys, we're nearly done. If you've watched the movie Saving Private Ryan, uh, you'll remember that, that Matt Damon's character is one of uh, four sons. Three of them have been killed in the war already. The military becomes aware of this, and then they send a platoon out at the cost of their lives to go and find him and bring him back home. They're saying, like, this family's lost too much already. Like, we, we, can't, we can't risk them losing another son. So Tom Hanks plays the character, uh, who, the captain who leads this platoon, and, and in the end, most of the guys lose their lives, and so does Tom Hanks at the very end, just before Matt Damon's character is, I mean, sorry if that's a spoiler alert, but that's from like 20 years ago. If you haven't watched it yet, 
That's on you. <laughs> and so I just want you to pay attention to the very closing scene of this movie. with you, I, I wasn't sure how I'd feel coming back here. Every day, I think about what you said to me that day on the bridge. I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope that at least in your eyes, I've earned what all of you have done for me. James? Captain John H. Miller. I want to be incredibly clear. The point of that illustration is not that we can have earned what has been done for us. That's, that, that is a, an understandable humanistic approach. The only point I want to make is that when you realize the cost involved in someone, or in this case, a platoon of people earning your freedom, so, so when you know that your life was literally spared and you've gotten to live an entire life because of men being willing to lay their lives down, um, that, that generates a response in you, hopefully. Now, by the way, it could generate survivor's guilt, and that, that has been the case for a lot of people. A lot of people have been deeply affected by survivor's guilt, but then there are others that I think are moved with gratitude. The one can harden our hearts, the other one can soften our hearts. And all that I'm encouraging you to do is to allow the kindness of God, the gift of God, the, the, the price that Jesus paid, to soften our hearts and to generate a response of gratitude which says, God, I'm gonna follow you. One step at a time, one day at a time, I'm gonna do the next right thing that I know to do. That's what it means to begin and to continue a relationship. That's why this could be day one for some people and then for others, this could be year 20, year 30, year 40. It is an ongoing, I wanna love you, God. I wanna allow you to love me. I want to, I want to do the next right thing that I know to do. That is what the gospel is. That is what Easter represents. We are reminded that God loves us. We've sinned. He's died for us. And we get to make a choice. So I want to invite you just to stand with me for a moment. And as I close in prayer, I'm going to invite you just to close your eyes for, for a few moments. <clears throat> and if you'll allow me just to kind of facilitate about 20 or 30 seconds of silence. I just want you to reflect on this question of where are you? It's the question that God asked the first woman and man after they had rejected his way. Where are you? The question wasn't for information. It was actually, I believe, an invitation 
for them to respond back saying, I'm here. I've messed up. I need help. I do want to have that relationship with you restored. So just, just for a few more seconds, can you just reflect on that question? Regardless of how long you've been in a relationship with God or whether you're even still investigating a relationship, where are you?